This is CBC Here and Now. This minister has abused his position. He must resign, and he must resign today. I think any good MHA and minister ought to know the rules. A report says this cabinet minister should be disciplined. Today, Christopher Mitchell Moore is once again under fire for giving Carla Foote a top job at the rooms. The city of St. John's passed its 2020 budget tonight, and no new taxes are coming. We'll have all the details live from City Hall coming up. Good evening. Welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. A turbulent, heated day at the House of Assembly today. The opposition wants Cabinet Minister Christopher Mitchellmore to step aside for something that happened just over a year ago. I feel that the person who is in this job, Carla Foote, is amply qualified to do so. This is a lateral move. These positions happen. They have happened. And I'm very pleased to see that she is in this role, serving in the capacity so that the rooms can do the good work that it does. Well, this morning, CBCNL broke a story about an investigation that the citizens' representative started last winter. The Mitchell Moore report examines how Liberal staffer Carla Foote landed a high-paying job at the rooms, and it finds that the cabinet minister misused his position to hire the daughter of the Lieutenant Governor, Judy Foote, and that Mitchell Moore did so after the Premier offered her the job. So, how do we get here? This man, Brad Moss, is the citizen's representative, and acting on a complaint by a whistleblower, he investigated the hiring of Carla Foote at the rooms last fall. She was given the new role of executive marketing director. Foote is the daughter of Lieutenant Governor Judy Foote. Both women were active liberals and good friends with Premier Dwight Ball. Out of this investigation came the Mitchellmore Report, which examines how the hire all started with a phone call. On September 21st last year, Chris Mitchellmore called Dean Brinton, the CEO of the rooms, and Brinton was told that Carla Foote would receive this new top job. Why? The report says it's because Premier Dwight Ball personally offered the position to her, and the report says Chris Mitchellmore grossly mishandled his obligations as a cabinet minister. Well, now, the Premier wasn't in the House today, so Minister Siobhan Cody was fielding questions on the floor, and here's what she had to say about the hiring. I will say that it has been very reasonable against mul across multiple governments that movement of, uh, of personnel from either core government or crown corporations is not an unusual uh, circumstance, Mr. Speaker. So I can say I can say that, and I will also say, Mr. Speaker, that. Uh, uh, as the report is table, we can get into the details of that report. But I will remind everyone in this House, it does deal with a human resources matter and that we should be sensitive to that. Well, not surprisingly, the Mitchellmore report dominated question period. Both opposition parties drilled into it while the government described, as you heard, that this is a hiring issue, an HR matter. Well, here now is Katie Breen was watching all of this from the press gallery in the House. So Katie is in our newsroom, as you can see there. What does the opposition make of all this, Katie? Well, both leaders say that he needs to be ousted from cabinet. They say Mitchell Moore abused his position and that all this smells like patronage, favoritism and a backdoor deal. Here's Crosby. This utterly undermines the integrity of a cabinet, which as a group of officers of this province, the highest officers in the province of the political arm of government, the integrity of the institution will be destroyed if this minister stays in his position. He's got to go. Mitchell Moore wouldn't face reporters today. Instead, he sent out a 23-word statement saying he wouldn't be taking questions, but that he would be apologizing. Now, the premier, who was also implicated in all of this, he wasn't at the House of Assembly today. He's in Toronto meeting with other premiers. Coffin says if he was in fact involved in all this, he should be held accountable. I would like to see a recommendation come from perhaps the uh, Commissioner for Legislative Standards, but certainly a, uh, I would think a reprimand would be a reasonable, uh, a reasonable thing to expect from the Premier and certainly an apology in the House. Now Ball is expected back in the House tomorrow. Uh, now that the report is out and tabled, he says that the Liberals will be able to answer more fulsome uh, about all of this. But the question is, will they? Anthony. Uh, we'll see how this unfolds, of course, as Katie Breen reporting live from our newsroom. 
And we are going to find out how this will unfold when the Premier returns tomorrow. I mean, he did send us a statement just moments ago, or one of his uh, communications people did. Uh, just got that through the phone. He says, I just concluded this a quote. I just concluded meetings today with Canada's Premiers here in Toronto around matters that are important to Newfoundlanders and Labradorians and all Canadians. I've been catching up on the news out of the House of Assembly, and I want to clarify that I did not direct anyone to hire Ms. Foote for a job at the rooms. Well now, from the very beginning of this, Ball has maintained that hiring Carla Foote was above board and a good decision. Uh, you know, Carla Foote, what I know, I work with her quite some time and she's worked, she was the uh, Director of Communications for the government and the job at the, at, at the rooms was something that she was qualified for and I think, you know, that all of us, you know, that would know Carla would see the, uh, would understand that she's, uh, you know, capable of doing that job. I worked very closely with her. from one storm to another we have some wet windy weather on the way going to start with our headlines some freezing rain tomorrow uh, in the afternoon for most of the island looking at a wintry mix for the northern peninsula later on in the evening and uh, southeastern labrador in for some snow uh, as we get into wednesday so this is how it's going to play out uh, tomorrow afternoon we have that uh, mix of freezing rain and rain hitting the south coast uh, later in the afternoon the east, the Avalon Peninsula looking at uh, some showers, but mostly freezing rain where you see all that pink. And then later on in the afternoon, that's going to hit the northern peninsula and work its way into Labrador. So I'll have all those details a little later, Anthony. Thanks, Carol. Well, three years ago, Jennifer Hillier Penny vanished and her loved ones are still waiting for a police investigation to answer a fundamental question. Just what happened? On Saturday, Hillier Penny's friends and family marched through St. Anthony to try to keep her memory alive, and CBC's Troy Turner was there. The march through St. Anthony goes ahead in the wind and cold, because after three years, these people don't want Jennifer Hillier Penny to become a cold case. We have not forgotten, we have not given up, and that we will continue to fight until something has been done, until we see justice for Jennifer. Sandy Hillier hopes someone will speak up to reveal details that will crack the case. She says she won't be mad that it took so long. She just wants to know what happened to her aunt. But she won't let that for us and our efforts. There's sadness here. It's mixed with anger and frustration. Gary Hillier is running out of patience, waiting to know how and why his sister disappeared. We need more drastic action. We need, we need answers. We need to get in people's faces and make some noise. We're waiting on the RCMP, but it seems like that's not going to work. So maybe we should take it in our own hands and not break the law, but, you know, make people uncomfortable. It was December 2016 when Jennifer disappeared. In St. Anthony, they say that's long enough for the police to put together the puzzle of Hillier Penny's last day. There's no mystery. What happened to Jennifer, he says is a mystery, but it's not a mystery. We know who done it. We know who's responsible. And we know who's covering it up. It's just a matter for them to talk. Every year without answers makes it harder to hold on to the one thing the family has been clinging to all this time. Uh, unfortunately, now three years later, you, you start to lose hope, and, and that's terrible. Like, you know, this is hard enough, and without hope, it's even tougher. Uh, but we got to keep going. Police are not saying a whole lot about the Jennifer Hillier Penny case. However, in an email, the RCMP said an investigation remains active. Police do feel there are others that know something about this case that have not yet come forward, and it encourages anyone to do so by contacting the RCMP immediately. Troy Turner, CBC News, Cornerbrook. A controversial prison psychiatrist is denying claims that he failed to give an inmate the medical care that she required. Dr. David Craig is named in a lawsuit filed by Natasha Martin after her daughter Sky died in 2018. Here now is Mark Quinn reports. Sky Martin was 27 when she died at the Correctional Centre for Women in Clarenville. In August, her mother, Natasha Martin, filed a lawsuit claiming Dr. David Craig's treatment of Sky there was negligent. Now, Craig has filed a statement of defense saying the care he gave Sky Martin was appropriate. Craig, who's provided psychiatric services at the province's correctional facilities for two decades, assessed Martin numerous times in Clarenville. After he first saw her, Craig concluded she had a personality disorder, 
but in his words she was not depressed, anxious, or otherwise distressed, and he began to taper her off previously prescribed medications. After another assessment, Craig describes Martin as, quote, somewhat unkempt and silly in her demeanor, but otherwise unremarkable, unquote. Martin was pronounced dead a couple of days later on August 21, 2018, after choking on a sandwich wrapper she forced down her own throat. Craig says Natasha Martin's claims that he showed disregard for her daughter's health and rights are egregious and inflammatory. He wants Martin to cover his legal costs if her allegations aren't proven in court. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. The trial for a man charged with burning down a historic mansion got underway today in St. John's, and it all started with an agreement. Lawyers for the prosecution and defense agreed that this fire, which you'll see, was started by an arsonist on July 7, 2016. But whether that arsonist was co-owner David Badrudin remains to be seen. Waterford Manor was built in 1905, and it housed some of the province's most influential families. The Bedrudens bought the home in the 1900s, uh, 1990s rather. Police and firefighters found four gas cans strategically placed throughout the middle and upper floors. The building has since been torn down. Today, a jury was selected, and the first witnesses are expected to be called tomorrow morning. A postal van caught fire in St. John's yesterday morning, destroying the vehicle and a number of Christmas packages inside it. It happened on Forest Road around 11 a.m. and by the time firefighters arrived, as you see there, flames had swallowed the vehicle. The driver wasn't injured. He was outside of the van at the time, good thing. The fire appears to have started in the engine area, then it flames quickly moved through the open van and to the mail and the parcels in the rear. And all those flames you see there, the smoke, and then of course the water, it damaged all of the mail. The company hasn't said yet what will happen for people whose packages were destroyed. A father and son from Whitless Bay who were accused of kidnapping but who received massive support from their community have had their charges withdrawn. A two-day trial was supposed to begin at Provincial Court in St. John's today for Stephen and Mitchell Maloney. The men were facing charges of breaking and entering, assault and unlawful confinement. But as proceedings began, the court was told that the Crown would not be calling any evidence. So the judge dismissed the charges. The Maloney's arrest last year sparked a rally in the community in support of them. And while it was never explicitly said, it was implied that the men's alleged actions were the result of increased crime in the area. The Maloney's were not in court this morning. Their lawyer says they are pleased with this outcome. Well, some students are getting an unexpected holiday. Nine schools in the province will be closed from St. John's to Cornerbrook, and it's because the schools were ordered by federal court to provide information on how teachers and staff are using copyright protected material. An extensive search is being done on all relevant records and documents. One school was closed last week, two were closed today, and more are expected to shut down in the coming days. Well, the provincial government has been slow to roll out an action on an election promise that's related to bus passes. The plan would see the province provide metro bus passes to all income support clients in the Metro St. John's area and not just those who qualify for medical transportation. The government said it would happen within six months. Well, that time has come and gone. The province says work is still underway to make it happen, though. Officials are currently assessing options for delivery of the plan in early 2020. One thing that we have done and that we've committed to in uh, the election this past year was to ensure that everybody in the St. John's metro area would have a bus pass which would make access to medical care and other services more affordable and that's something we're firmly committed to do. Well, as you may have heard last week on the program, for the first time, Newfoundland is hosting an international sledge hockey tournament. And some of the best players from around the world are playing in paradise this week. Fans can see Team Canada's Paralympic team take on the U.S., Russia, as well as the Czech Republic, all great sledge hockey countries. The tournament kicked off over the weekend and is going to run until December the 7th. Organizers say they hope it will encourage fans, both new and old, to come out and experience something they haven't seen before. They're on like sleds and stuff, and yeah, and they're like, it's a lot more physical and stuff. Just their ability to move up and down the ice as fast as they can, uh, just gives you a different appreciation for the game, I must say. It's, uh, it's awesome. I'm 
it's very impressive they how they can balance on that without like two skates oh it's amazing like um and for all the years I've been playing, I didn't think that something this caliber w would ever be here. Well, a doctor who delivered many of the babies born in Labrador in recent decades has died. Dr. Visla Ralik was a well-known and highly respected obstetrician gynecologist. Ralik was originally from Poland but worked on the Northern Peninsula before moving to Labrador in 1989. I realize now looking at him that I met him with Jacob Barker, a fascinating man. He was the only obstetrician and gynecologist in Happy Valley Goose Bay for decades and his, in his 50-year career, he delivered thousands of babies. And colleagues say he had a special quality and put his patient's care above everything else. Rollick died on the weekend. Well, friends of a little girl from Victoria, Conception Bay, helped pull off a special surprise this weekend, one that made Emma Clark's dreams come true. At first, she was speechless. She just immediately wanted to get on, which was shocking to us, because ordinarily Emma would be shy around animals, especially a horse. Um, but she got on and didn't want to get off. On Saturday at a barn in the Goulds, friends of six-year-old Emma arranged for her to meet a real-life unicorn, which you can see right there. The six-year-old is battling a form of kidney cancer. She was first diagnosed at just four and a half years of age and has since spent a lot of time at the Janeway. Emma has lost her left kidney, but her mom says she always has a smile on her face. And this weekend, as you see, that smile was bigger than ever. No new taxes. The city of St. John's passed its $305 million budget tonight at City Hall. We'll tell you what's in it with the person, the councillor who presented it. That's coming up later in the show.
Anyone like a hot chocolate from CBC? Oh. Hot you guys, hot chocolate for a cold day? Hi, everybody. Is that hot chocolate? It sure is. Would you like one? You sure can. Oh, yeah. Hot chocolate on a cold day. I want some hot chocolate. Happy to warm you guys up? Here you go. Thank you. Yes. Our Thank pleasure. You. So while you're warming up with the hot chocolate, what warms your heart at Christmas time? My family and my friends. Seeing all the families get together. Yeah. Such a special occasion. What warms your heart at Christmas time? Uh, I'd say all the giving. Presents. Presents. Seeing it all through their eyes is, is the most heartwarming for me. You spend some time thinking about people who need some help to feel that way also? Oh, 100%. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, giving back to the, yeah. the community is an amazing thing this time of year. Try to put a little bit of extra help out there. Everybody seems to donate more now and food banks and all that stuff. Christmas includes everybody and that's what's important. It's just, you know, everybody feels the, the warmth of the season. Hot chocolate for you guys? What'd you say? Thank you. You're welcome. Merry Christmas. There's a here and now's elf, Zach Gowdy, <laughs> warming your heart there, telling you about that fundraising camp. It was nice. Yeah, it was really nice. Yeah. That whole thing just warmed my heart. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful sentiments mm -hmm. uh, in that video. Now, the fundraising campaign goes all through the month of December, and you can visit our website, CBCNL. Uh, to donate uh, online. Yeah, and on Thursday, December 12th, we're doing our annual Feed NL Day event at the Avalon Mall where CBC personalities like Anthony will be wrapping you, gifts. Right. <laughs> yeah, live music there. too. Yeah, live, live music. music. And uh, of course, we'll be accepting donations. Yeah, always a lot of fun too. If you've never been, you can actually see how we make TV in the mm -hmm. mall as part of it. And there's lots of donations happening. It is a great time. So if you can make it, love to see you there. Yeah. Now, as for All the right. weather. Uh, yes, the weather. But before we get oh. to the weather, I have these beautiful photos oh, that I just okay. wanted to share. They were sent in to us uh, of the Signal Hill foxes. I just they thought they were lovely. Oh, wow. Isn't that beautiful? Nice colors. Yeah. So, uh, Javid Luxar? I'm not sure if that's how I can You're brave. His name. <laughs> Thank you so much for sending uh, those in to us. Uh, beautiful, beautiful pictures. So, Mr. or Mrs. Luxar, send us the uh, <laughs> pronunciation, but thanks for the photos. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's great. Yeah, All wonderful. right, so let's have a look at the weather now. Things are pretty quiet tonight, uh, but it's definitely not going to stay that way. You can see not a whole lot of precipitation over the island or Labrador uh, overnight tonight. So pretty quiet overnight lows, minus five in St. John's, minus seven in central area. So it's gonna be a, a very calm, chilly evening, mostly uh, clear skies, a little bit of cloud cover and light winds for the west coast. And uh, similar story in Labrador, colder temperatures and much windier uh, along the coast though. But uh, not much by way of snow or rain until we get into tomorrow. So this is kind of tomorrow afternoon is when all of these warnings are going to be kicking in. We have a wind warning for uh, the rec house area gusts up to 120 kilometers an hour. We have special weather statements in effect for uh, the tip of the northern peninsula and for areas in central. And uh, yeah, so this is going to be tomorrow evening when uh, this area will will start seeing that wintry mix of rain and snow about 10 centimeters of snow expected to fall along with some ice pellets. So tomorrow evening overnight is going to be pretty nasty there. And then we have freezing rain for much of the west and central south coast areas uh, for tomorrow up to 10 millimeters of rain. So driving conditions are not going to be great tomorrow. It's probably going to be quite slippery on the roads. This is the system that's heading our way. Going to hit the south coast uh, at about you know early in the afternoon tomorrow. Bring with it the freezing rain and mostly rain for the east. So for the Buren Peninsula, uh, Bonavista Peninsula and Avalon Peninsula, mostly rain there, but freezing rain uh, right here, moving up towards the Northern Peninsula. Here we are seven o'clock, still hasn't quite reached the Northern Peninsula yet. So we're looking at about five millimeters of rain for St. John's tomorrow. The winds are gonna pick up to uh, Easterly's 30 gusting to 50. As we move into central, that freezing rain there, temperatures hovering around the freezing mark. 
as we move to the west coast, the winds really ramp up with that wind warning that's in effect for the rec house area. More rain expected there too, 5 to 10 millimeters uh, there. And as we head up into the straits, things are going to be mostly clear there tomorrow. Lots of sunshine on the menu uh, for the daytime. Going to change as we get into the nighttime as well for the rest of uh, Labrador. Looking at lots of sunshine and light winds and cool temperatures. But then as we get into uh, tomorrow night, that's when this special weather statement kicks in and we're looking at some snow that's going to uh, hit southeastern uh, Labrador up through Upper Lake Melville uh, between 5 and 20 centimeters of snow, depending on where you are. So I'll get into some more of those details a bit later. Anthony. Thanks, Carolyn. The city of St. John's has just released the details of budget 2020. It's the second in a three year budget plan that the city has laid out. Now, uh, Jeremy Eaton is reporting live from City Hall tonight where he's got the very latest as well as the councillor who presented that budget. So, Jeremy, what can us taxpayers expect? Well, the, the good news that uh, all the councillors and the mayor were talking about tonight is that there will be no tax increase. There was a, a slight one last year for residents, a little bit of a larger one for business owners, and the water tax went up last year as well. That was $25 increase. But this year, there are no new taxes. But the city also found a way to increase some services. So Metro Bus is going to look a little bit different for some of the younger riders. But there is sort of one point of contention in this budget that people might not be happy about, and that's that the city is going to have to spend more money on St. John's Sports and Entertainment. That's obviously the Conference Center and Mile One Center. But the councillor who presented it is joining us now. Uh, councillor Dave Lane, thanks for uh, stepping on to here and now. Great to be here. How challenging was this budget. Uh, earlier tonight we spoke and you said that there was a chance that there could have been a mill rate increase, but there wasn't. How hard was this budget for you? Well, you know, it's made a bit easier by the fact that we now do three-year budgeting. This is about the, I think it's the third time we've done three-year projections. So last year when we announced the uh, 2019 to 2021 budget, we did have those increases and we had projected potential increases this year and next year. So we spent this year finding adjustments and savings uh, and new ways of doing things to keep uh, things level. But we were able to find enough room to make a few adjustments that you mentioned earlier that is going to make life hopefully a bit better for people in the city. First of all, really quickly, how did the city find some savings? Uh, you know, some of them were adjustments where we projected, for example, electricity rates. They haven't gone up yet, so we were able to mitigate that. Um, but also, we have been able to pay down some of our pension debt liability, which, which is going to save us money uh, on interest, et cetera. So these are the type of things. But also, internally, we're constantly looking for ways of doing things a bit more efficiently. So a number of line items saw improvements there just by uh, looking at how we've done things before and how we're going to do them better going forward. For people who don't uh, attend the budget or watch it uh, on the city's website, uh, every councillor and the mayor get their chance to weigh in on the budget that uh, Councillor Lane has presented, and all of them talked about Metrobus. Can you say why everybody was so happy when it came to Metrobus here tonight? Right. Well, you know, when we first got into this term, uh, we made an announcement uh, on that budget year that we're going to invest in public transit. And we've spent really the past two years investigating that. Uh, you know, we've already made a few changes to our Go Bus accessible service. Um, but the Dillon report was what that full review was, came out last month, and we're now going to make concrete actions toward implementing those recommendations. And uh, the examples that I gave today is that we're now going to add a pilot. Uh, service to Galway commercial area. Uh, that's going to start March 2nd. As well on March 2nd, we're going to implement free transit, you mentioned this, for children 11 years and younger. And that is very important to us because it's getting people on the bus younger, but it's also enabling families uh, to take their kids because if you think about it, paying for four uh, bus fares is a lot more expensive than paying for one or two. So that's a significant one. As well, we're implementing what we're calling the frequent transit network. That is the core routes that, meet the, that hit the main destinations throughout the city, and we're making sure that those headways, those times that you can wait for a bus, are as short as possible. Now, KPMG uh, recently did a uh, review of Mile One Sports and, sorry, St. John's Sports Entertainment, Mile One, and the Conference Center. But tonight it was announced that uh, a million more dollars is going to have to be spent in that operating grant coming from the city. Can you explain that to taxpayers? Right. That's definitely significant and worth discussing. Uh, you know, the first one that people are aware of is that we have a significantly positive and lease agreement with the two teams, and you know we really want to support those teams and their success. So we had an increase uh, in, in contribution to them. That's a part of it. Two hundred fifty 
$50,000. Um, but you know, the lion's share of that increase comes from the fact that we're seeing less events uh, coming. And uh, that is due in part just because of uh, people are touring less these days, the conferences uh, aren't coming uh, as frequently, but also in Canada, we have a lower dollar compared to the US. So with that in mind, uh, we have the increased subsidy, but a small portion of that is actually going to be investment in resolving those issues by you know, looking for restructuring or better promotion. Councillor Lane, I appreciate your time and thanks so much. Great, thanks, Jeremy. All right, that's Councillor Dave Lane. I'm Jeremy Eaton, uh, live at City Hall, reporting for Here and Now. <laughs> the opposition had a spring in its step today. When we come back, we'll get back to our top story the Mitchellmore Report.
Let's go right back to our top story this evening, the Mitchell Moore Report. As we told you earlier, the Commissioner for Legislative Standards is recommending that Cabinet Minister Christopher Mitchell Moore be reprimanded over the hiring of Carla Foote. An investigation found that Mitchell Moore violated the government's code of conduct when he named the longtime Liberal staffer to a vacant position at the rooms and increased that position's salary. Here's how politicians responded outside the legislature. Does he have a right to remain in Cabinet? And the answer is a resounding no. This minister has abused his position. He may well have misled the House when we questioned him on this going back over the last year. He must resign, and he must resign today from the Cabinet. That's a different question from what sanction ought to be imposed on him come, you know, his, the consideration of the report by the House. This investigation and this report, which I've only had time to glance at, deals with his misconduct as a member of the House. His misconduct and his abuses as a minister, those are for the Premier to deal with. This man cannot remain in the Cabinet. He must resign today. This is a grievous uh, error on his part. He knew what he was doing and uh, he was directed to do it. I have some serious concerns as his ability to carry on as a, uh, a minister and to do his duties as appropriate. I, I, I haven't read exactly the Premier's response or the, the Premier's involvement in it, but uh, certainly if he was directing this, he ought to be held accountable as well. We heard Alison Coffin mention that she's looking for answers from the Premier, and we did present a statement we received from Dwight Ball's office just as we went to air, in which he says he did not direct anybody to hire Ms. Foote for a job at the rooms. Well, Ball wasn't in the legislature today. He was in Ottawa for a meeting with the Premiers, and that's where we are going for our next story. The Premiers and territorial leaders have finished the first of two days of meetings near Toronto, strategizing on the best way to work with Ottawa. I respectfully would ask that our Prime Minister and the federal government now work with the leaders at this table. Well, they came up with a list of key demands for the federal government, including a focus on economic competitiveness, getting resources to the market, and developing northern Canada. They also want a boost in health care transfers. The Premiers are expected to meet with the Prime Minister sometime in the new year. Up next, CBC News has uncovered information that shows the federal government ignored early warnings about the health risks of vaping.
Welcome back. CBC News has uncovered information that shows the federal government ignored early warning signs about the health risks of vaping. One of vaping's early sales pitches was that it actually helps people to quit smoking. But our investigation found that the government's approval of vaping devices was made without any conclusive evidence. And now millions of Canadians, including many teenagers, are exposed to potential harm. The CBC's Christine Birak reports. The latest numbers show an alarming increase in the use of nicotine vaping products among teenagers. Nearly one in three high school students in Alberta and Quebec say they would vaped in the past month. It's one in four in Ontario and about one in five in British Columbia. We're seeing more and more youth say that they feel that they're addicted to vaping. So essentially it's bad news on all fronts in terms of youth. A public health professor, David Hammond, tracks smoking and now vaping among high school students. He thought e-cigarettes or vapes could be a less harmful tool to help smokers quit. We still have five million adult smokers. One out of every two or three are likely to die unless they quit. But there has never been any firm evidence showing that vaping is less harmful or that it could help smokers quit. Still, Health Canada became convinced, and in 2018, it legalized vape products. But doctors say it failed to put adequate rules in place to control a growing vape industry. And, and one wants to be polite, but, but it's, it's sort of a hypocrisy between what we're doing with tobacco, and what, which contains nicotine as, as the major you know, psychoactive substance, versus vaping, which again, guess what? The same psychoactive substance is the, is the nicotine, and we're essentially hands off and, and minimal uh, regulation. Sweet flavors were allowed, ads popped up everywhere, and vape products were being sold next to candy in convenience stores. All of it in an effort to appeal to adult smokers. Hammond says the plan didn't work. Health Canada needs to act quickly and change course. Maybe the biggest losers in this equation, some of them are the adult smokers for whom this could have helped. And now we have a new generation of nicotine users to go along with them. So, yeah, it's shocking. And surveys show the number of kids vaping in Canada is still rising. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. The province of New Brunswick is denying liability for a sexual assault that happened in one of its special care homes. In 2017, a mentally disabled adult resident was molested by a registered sex offender who recently moved into the facility. The victim's mother is now suing the province for negligence, saying it should have known about the man's criminal history and the potential danger that he posed. Rachel Cave has more. Two years ago, Andrew Douglas moved into the red building behind me. In 2017, it was Joanne's special care home, licensed by the province as a residence for adults with special needs. Within weeks of moving in, Douglas sexually assaulted an adult disabled resident. We can't identify the victim because of a publication ban. But Douglas did plead guilty to that sexual assault and was sentenced to two years in jail. Once the matter was resolved in the criminal justice system, the victim's mother filed a civil lawsuit. She is suing the province for negligence. She says the province should have known and could have known that Douglas had a previous criminal record. In 2011, he was registered as a sex offender after trying to persuade a young girl to show him her breasts online. And in 2016, he received a conditional sentence for a separate sexual assault. In a statement of defense, the province said it was aware that Douglas had done time for assaulting a girlfriend and that he had been serving a conditional sentence. The province said it was up to Douglas's father to tell the special care home operator everything he knew and disclose his son's criminal history before his son moved in. The province says it owes no special duty of care to the vulnerable residents in its special care home. And it claims if the province does award damages to the victim, it should be Andrew Douglas and his father who pay. Rachel Cave, CBC News, St. John. The United Nations annual climate change conference opened today in Spain with a stark warning for world leaders. If we don't urgently change our way of life, we jeopardize life itself. Delegates from almost 200 countries are taking part in the two week long conference. Their goal? To step up efforts to stop global warning, warming rather, by speeding up cuts to carbon emissions and firming up rules on carbon trading. The UN Secretary General said new data shows that greenhouse gases have hit a record high and he fears the world is at risk of sleepwalking past a point of no return. 
In her first British television interview, Prince Andrew's accuser says that Jeffrey Epstein flew her to London when she was 17 to have sex with the prince. Virginia Jufri is imploring the British public to stand beside her. This is not some sordid sex story. This is a story of being trafficked. This is a story of abuse. And this is a story of your guys' your, your guys' royalty. Prince Andrew has said he can't remember ever meeting Jufri, and now Buckingham Palace is again denying any sexual contact or relationship between her and Prince Andrew. Well, Justin Trudeau is in London this evening, joining leaders from 29 countries gathered to celebrate the 70th anniversary of NATO. But the two-day summit comes as the world's biggest military alliance braces for friendly fire from a key ally. And as Evan Dyer reports, some of the issues could leave Canada on the defensive. Well, this is the 70th anniversary of NATO, but there's not exactly a birthday mood in the run-up to this summit. Instead, we've seen a lot of recriminations, some of them about money. That's a perennial at NATO with the U.S. pressuring other countries to spend more on defense. But the pressure is a lot more intense in the era of Donald Trump than it has been in the past. The Europeans are pushing back, saying we don't want to talk only about money issues. We need to talk about the core strategic purpose of NATO. And there have even been questions, uh, particularly from France and from French President Emmanuel Macron, about Article 5, the promise that an attack on one NATO member will be treated as an attack on all. Some European members appear to have doubts in the era of Donald Trump whether the United States will be there for them if the chips are down, if there were to be, for example, Russian aggression in Europe. Uh, there's also tension between other NATO members and Turkey, an important member of NATO, but a member that's gone a little bit rogue lately, buying weapons from Russia and also staging operations in Syria, Turkey's backyard, but operations that have been in conflict with NATO's own anti-Islamic state operation in Syria. And we've seen Turkey accusing other NATO members of sympathizing with its Kurdish enemies, even accusing France of supporting terrorism. So it's a tense summit and one where Canada expects to receive a lot of pressure on the topic of money with demands to contribute to a new, bigger, rapid reaction force, and also on the issue of Huawei, where the U.S. continues to push other NATO members, including Canada, to ban that Chinese telecommunications firm. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, to the other side of the world now, an emergency warning has been issued along the east coast of Australia. Crews are again struggling to fight wildfires as winds fanned flames into residential areas. It's a uh, bit frightening. I mean, it's not so bad if you didn't have the wind. Uh, but once that wind comes up, you just don't know. It's because it's swirling all over the place, you know. It's sort of a, you don't know what's gonna, what it's going to do. Fires along the New South Wales coast have become more ferocious the last 24 hours. Firefighters warn residents that high winds are turning the flames back towards neighbourhoods. Some highways have been closed since July the 2nd. Uh, sorry, since July, rather, 2 million hectares of mostly uninhabited land has been scorched by one of the worst fire seasons ever in the country, and more than 600 homes in the area have been destroyed. Well, heavy rain continues to create havoc along the southern coast of France with flash flooding, which has closed roads and left thousands without power. It's been unseasonably wet on the country's Mediterranean coast. Days of relentless rain have flooded homes and destroyed many businesses. Many streets remain submerged in muddy water and many areas are on an emergency alert. This comes after torrential rains caused similar problems just last week, as well as along the coasts of Italy and Greece. Well, it's never too cold for a Santa Claus parade, even in Labrador. We'll give you a glimpse of the weekend celebrations there when we come back.
Welcome back. Well, it's that time of the year again, Carolyn, where uh, we all stand out in the cold, mm -hmm. hoping to get a glimpse of uh, Santa, perhaps? The man himself. Every community has a different date for their Christmas parade. And yesterday, Labrador City held its march through the community. Just have a look. A little cooler. Yep. Uh, <laughs> yeah, with a bit of snow to shovel. Going a nice, safe speed. Mm -hmm. But it sure looks Christmassy. It really does. You need to really bundle up. <laughs> it, it does look cool. Yeah, out watching that, my goodness. Yeah, or you could be dressed in one of those nice costumes. Uh -huh. I'll keep you warm. Ah, <laughs> uh, the train. Oh, great floats. Well, they do have nice ones. And let's see. Yeah, they're pretty bundled up. <laughs> Yeah, there is quite the difference between the temperature in yeah. Lab City and uh, most other areas in yeah. the province right now. Oh, Lab West. Let's get a good time there. Yeah. It's a little breezy. Okay, no, that's just tilting <laughs> over. <laughs> a little bit of wind to contend with. Nice. There's some great floats. Yeah. Polar Express, off you go. It's like a lot of work yeah. put into it. Yeah. And well, there we go. And I guess Santa will be coming up now. I think he should be there somewhere. Where is a guy? What? Nice. We're, we're, oh. All right. Okay. Yeah, well, still a few days to go before Christmas, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's have a look at the long range okay. forecast. And I'm sorry to say things are going to be staying so, so. pretty messy for okay. the next few days. Yeah. Uh, pretty much everywhere. So I'm going to do a little recap of these watches and warnings in place. The wind warning for the rec house area for tomorrow gusts up to 120 kilometers an hour. We have the freezing rain warning and uh, the northern peninsula looking at that uh, wintry mix of uh, rain, snow, ice pellets that's going to hit tomorrow night and freezing rain for much of the island, excluding uh, Buren Bonavista and the Avalon Peninsula. So about 10 millimeters of rain coming down there. So uh, this is the outlook for tomorrow. Fairly mild in St. John's, six degrees as the high with the, that rain throughout the day. Fairly breezy, gusts up to 50 through central areas. We're looking at that freezing rain happening there and high winds on the west coast paired with that freezing rain. So it's going to be pretty nasty. You can see St. Anthony is uh, just having cloudy skies tomorrow, but that's going to change as we get into the evening hours. Sunshine for most of Labrador tomorrow. Cool temperatures, uh, minus 11 as the high in Lab City tomorrow with light winds. So as we get into tomorrow night, this is when this special weather statement kicks in for southeastern uh, Labrador. About 5 to 20 centimeters of snow uh, expected there. Less snow uh, in the upper Lake Melville area and uh, also Rigolette but uh, the heavier snow expected uh, in the Port Hope Sim Simpson uh, area. So this is how it's going to look. All of that freezing rain and rain turning into snow as it hits Labrador. And it's just going to stick around uh, for the day as well and start to clear off uh, into Wednesday evening. So we're looking at some pretty high winds uh, for the east for St. John's and for Marystown along with that rain. Temperatures uh, uh, seven degrees for St. John's on Wednesday, above zero all across the island. Five in uh, Grand Falls, Windsor with some rain there and uh, that messy mix up along the straits. Snow in Cartwright, Nain, a mix of sun and cloud and cool temperatures there on Wednesday. So Wednesday night into Thursday. We have another system that's coming up and it looks quite similar to the one that we're going to see tomorrow. We had that rain in the east and then snow in the west and that messy mix in between. So that's how it's looking on Thursday. That wind is going to stay pretty strong as well for St. John's and Marystown. Uh, and we have the snow and uh, that messy uh, weather for central areas and uh, moving ahead now to Friday things start to die down for the east we have mostly cloudy day temperatures still above zero and some flurries uh, chance for Saturday as we get into central some more flurries expected throughout the rest of the week for the west coast, a very similar story. Temperatures just below the freezing mark. As we get into Labrador, that snow is just going to continue on through until Saturday with those cool temperatures. For the west, we're looking at a possibility of a sunshine on Saturday, minus 13 as the high. And that's your forecast. Anthony, back to you.
back to you. Yes. Weather photo. Isn't this great? Can you see a what? A seal what, and a whale? A seal and a whale. That's double prizes. <laughs> it's great. I'll let you know where this photo was taken after the break. All right, let's take a look at the uh, ARC photo there with yeah. the channels, two by two should be, <laughs> but not those together. That's fascinating. What a Great timing. Yep. So this was taken in Kings Point. Kings Point? Kings Point. Lovely. Yeah, and I just, there we go. Let's get to see the whale a bit better there and the seagulls. The yep, seal. all the nature you want. Uh, Brandon Batstone, thank you so much for sending this in. Great shot. That is good timing. Now, is that timing or luck? Or is that the same thing? I don't know. It's yeah, yeah, probably a bit of both. Bit of both. Beautiful shot. Fins and flippers. <laughs> yeah, fins and flippers, but this yeah. time not on a plate in a photo. Uh, that's gorgeous stuff. Thank you very much, Brandon. Yeah, and if you have a photo you'd like to send in to us, please do. You can email us at nlphotos at cbc.ca. Well, that right. show kind of went by pretty quickly. Ooh, a lot of news. Lot. A lot of news for Monday. And of course, uh, the main story, the Mitchell Moore Report. Premier Dwight Ball will be back here in the province tomorrow. He's expected to talk about this issue. So we'll have all of that for you tomorrow on Here and Now. And you can check out our website, of course, cbc.ca slash nl. All right. All right. We'll see you then. Good night.